Hi, I'm Dr. Christy Winters, and welcome to this third video in the series that we're producing for SESTA training on data harmonization. And with me today is Yannick Brucker. Welcome back. Last time we looked at some of the challenges associated with the process of harmonization and some quality criteria that can be useful in guiding you in your harmonization, as well as examples of the harmonization process from a few international studies. What are we going to be talking about today, Yannick? So today we have a look on international standard classifications, which are used when harmonizing. And we will have two pretty popular examples for education and occupation classifications. And finally, we will provide you with some helpful resources. Definitely. So the first thing is probably to say what an international standard classification is. And it's a basis for handling and harmonizing data on an international level. So the challenge of an international metric like that is, one, it has to be able to be wide enough to be universal so it can fit onto different national structures like education or occupation in order for the same idea to be measured across countries. On the other hand, by imposing an international standard, you end up leaving out, as we talked about in the last video, a lot of the national context and sometimes important cultural and national things going on that help explain phenomenon in that country. Uh, it's also mostly associated with ex-ante output harmonization and finally, they are really often used for demographic variables like education, occupation, and industry. Yana, can you tell us a little bit about what you've learned about the history of these measures? So when international organizations started collecting international data pretty early, already by the end of the 19th century, they also gained interest in creating standardized coding schemes. And so with that development, also international standard classifications came up. These were, for instance, developed by UN organizations such as the UNESCO. And by now they are pretty often used and they provide researchers with multiple digit codes and also regular updates. Now it might be helpful to give two examples of popular social demographic variables to better understand the concept of standard classifications. The International Labour Organization has developed the International Standard Classification of Occupations, briefly called the ISCO, which provides a four-level hierarchy structured classification to classify jobs around the world. It divides those into 436 unit, units and those can be classified again into minor, sub-major and major groups. Let me give you an example to better understand the concept of the ESCO. Let's take lawyers as an occupation group. So lawyers would first of all be considered as professionals in their major group, which makes the first digit number two. Then you move on to the sub-major group of professionals. So there they are considered as legal, social and cultural professionals, which makes the second digit number six. In their third group, the minor group, they are considered as legal professionals, which makes the third number one. And the fourth digit gives the unit, which classifies them into lawyers. So by the end, you get the four level hierarchically structured classification 2611 for lawyers. That might seem pretty difficult at the beginning, but don't mind, the ISCO provides a good resource and you can find the classification structure on their website, which we provide in a link below. And this is very understandable and it won't be too hard to figure out what occupation gets which code. I think that was a really helpful explanation. We should probably do one more just to kind of reinforce this idea of the way that digits build up a code in these international standard classifications. So I'll explain an example from ISCED, which is the International Standard Classification of Education. It was developed by UNESCO and the two cross 
classification variables here are levels of education and field of education. So these are the two things that it also tries to represent. There are also multiple versions of this. There was one done in the 1970s, another one done in 1997, and then an updated one in 2011. So you might see ISCAD 2011 or ISCAD 97. You'll need to kind of pay attention to those versions because they're slightly different. So let's take an example and imagine, Yannick, that you were getting a bachelor's degree in biology. Your ISCAD code would be 645. The first number in that series represents your bachelor's degree. The second digit indicates that your degree is going to be in an academic field rather than in an apprenticeship field or other type of field. That's four. And then finally it indicates the level of degree that you're getting. And in this case, you're doing a three to four year first degree for your bachelor's. And so that number is five. Then we end up with your ISCAD code of 645. In order to then specify which field you're getting your bachelor's degree in, the ISCAD has another system of classifications by pairing up numbers. In this case, your number would be 42. The number 4 would represent that you're getting a degree in the scientific field. And the number 2 would indicate that you're doing a life science, like biology. So your ISCAD code is 645 and then 42 for the degree area that you're getting your education in. Again, this might seem a little bit overwhelming, and the ISCAD does have a website where you can go for some resources. There's also the website for the UNESCO Institute for Statistics that has the ISCAD handbook, and that has very, very detailed information on how to use their system and how to interpret their system. Maybe at this point we should mention that there are also regular updates on those standard classifications. I would recommend using the website surveycodings.org, which was developed in part by SESTA as part of the series EU project. And on surveycodings.org, you can go ahead and actually search for um, three different types of international standard classifications, education, industry, and occupation. So that's a really great resource to make sure that your data is mapped on precisely to these international codes. That's a really helpful resource and if you want even more information or orientation how you might work out with those international standard classifications, it can help to look at large international survey programs such as the ESS which provides a pretty good documentation on the website. And the ESS, for instance, also developed their own standard classification for education, which is EDU level and can also be found in other large studies, studies such as the EVS, the European Value Study. Yeah, so on, the, on their website, they have the coding schemes for their own standard classification of education and they also provide pretty good information on documentation and their classification. So what researchers can really take away is that when it comes to harmonizing your variables in your data to make it comparable, you do have a lot of resources, you also have a lot of choices, and it makes a difference when you make a, do a little bit of research into these topics and know why you're coding things or know what you want to code to for precisely what reasons and what comparability. And we hope this video series has helped. So in this series, we have today covered the use of international standard classifications when harmonizing data. We looked at popular examples, education and occupation, and we gave people some resources. So what will our final video be on, Yannick? Our final video will discuss the topic of documentation. We will go through the importance of transparency and fair data management. We will also look at the concept of metadata and provide you with some documentation standards that you should cover when doing your harmonization work. Sounds like a great video and very, very useful. So I'm sure you guys are all looking forward to that. Please join us in our next video from me and from Yannick. Bye. Bye.